بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وبعد um, so last week الحمد لله we concluded the chapter that looks at the external etiquettes of recitation of the Quran and external points of reflection and consideration and this evening inshallah we will cover the first four of ten internal um, etiquettes and and issues to do with reciting the Quran as mentioned by Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala in the Ihya al although this is a an abridged version as we said it's al-muhadzab min Ihya al by Sheikh Salih al-Shami uh, rahimahullah ta'ala hayyan aw maytan and so the author Hujjat al-Islam, rahimahullah, he says, al-bab al-thalith a'mal al-batani fi tilawa So the internal actions of recitation, i.e. what actions should we be engaged in when we are reciting the Qur'an internally. He says, wa hiya ashara, fahmu asl al-kalam, thumma ta'zim, thumma hudur al-qalb. He says they are ten. The first, fahmu asl al-kalam, to un- understand the Qur'an in and of itself, um, i.e. without reflection and tadabbur etc which we'll come to then he says thumma ta'zim and then the glorification glorification of who or what we'll see what he says inshallah thumma hudur al-qalb and then the presence of the heart thumma tadabbur and then reflection over the verses thumma tafahum and then a deeper um, attempt to extract meaning from the Quran thumma tkhalli an mawani' al-fahm and then to remove from oneself that which prevents the ability to understand thumma takhsis and then to um, particularize or to specialize so i'm not going to detail what he means we're going to see inshallah thumma ta'athur and then to be affected thumma taraqi and then to um, ascend thumma at-tabarri um, and then to um, to detach or to to uh, to distance oneself. So he says, So the first internal uh, action when reciting the Quran is to understand the the state of the Quran and its loftiness. So azama basically means its greatness to understand the greatness of the Quran. And he says, وَفَضْلِ اللَّهِ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى تعالى, The virtue of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَلُطْفُهُ بِخَلْقِهِ أَوْ وَلُطْفِهِ بِخَلْقِهِ And the uh, lutf is like, for example, the softness and the consideration um, and the, the, the blessing, I guess, the virtue that Allah has allowed us to, he says, في إصال معاني كلامه إلى أفهام خلقه Allowed us to understand his words. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been kind and generous um, and pleasant to us in the fact that he has given us the ability to understand his words or given us those who have the ability to understand his words. And so when we come to read the Quran, he's saying that we first have to understand the virtue of the Quran, the virtue of that which we are reading. Why? He's going to say, الثاني تعظيم أو تعظيم للمتكلم. So the second internal action is the glorification of the one who is speaking. And who is the one who's speaking? He says, فالقارئ عند البداية بتلاوة القرآن ينبغي أن يحضر في قلبه عظمة المتكلم. So the reciter of the Quran prior to starting his recitation of the Quran should present in his heart, i.e. bring present in his heart the greatness of the one who is speaking, i.e. the one who sent the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَيَعْلَمَ أَنَّ مَا يَقْرَأُهُ لَيْسَ مِنْ كَلَامِ الْبَشَرِ And he should know that that which he is reading is not from the words of men, it's not from the words of humans. وَأَنَّ فِي تَلَاوَةِ كَلَامِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ غَايَةُ الْخَطَرِ And in reading the, the Qur'an, there is a danger attached to it. فَإِنَّهُ تَعَالَى قَالْ لَا يَمَسُهُ إِلَّا الْمُطَّهَرُونَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not be read by who? Anyone except المطهرون, those who purify themselves and those who are purified. What does he mean? 
Why is he using this verse? He says, وَكَمَا أَنَّ ظَاهِرَ جِلْدِ الْمُصْحَفِ وَوَرَقِهِ مَحْرُوسٌ عَنْ ظَاهِرِ بَشَرَةِ اللَّامِسِ إِلَّا إِذَا كَانَ مُتَطَهِرًا فَبَاطِنْ مَعْنَاهُ أَيْضًا بِحُكْمِ عِزِّهِ وَجَلَالِهِ مَحْجُوبٌ عَنْ بَاطِنِ الْقَلْبِ إِلَّا إِذَا كَانَ مُتَطَهِرًا عَنْ كُلِّ رِجِلْ So he says just as the external part of the Qur'an, i.e. the jild, the, the, uh, the cover of the Qur'an, that which we hold from the outside, it's not allowed for a person to touch it or to pick it up, etc., except that they are in a state of what? Tahara, purification. He says, likewise, the internal part of the Quran, i.e., the meanings, they are prevented, mahjub. So they are prevented between them and the reciter is a hijab, a prevention, except for those who have purified themselves internally. Meaning, the meanings of the Quran cannot reach a corrupt heart. And does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us this? He does. It's a guidance for who? The people of taqwa. And the, the lowest form of purification of the heart is to have at least a shadow of la ilaha illallah wa shadow anna Muhammad rasulullah. Why? Because a person has rooted from their heart associating partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so you find a non-Muslim will read the Quran, doesn't affect them. A munafiq will read the Qur'an, doesn't affect them. Why? Because their heart has been prevented from benefiting from the Qur'an as it's not pure. Just as a person will be prevented from touching the Qur'an because he is not pure, i.e. no wudu or ghusl. And then he says, um, And so the person who who is able to understand the Qur'an is the person who has purified his heart and his heart is mustanir. It is guided. Light has been placed in it. Um, by what? By the fact that he glorifies Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he sanctifies that which Allah has made a sanctuary, which is the Qur'an. And so the person of guidance from the Qur'an is the person who first glorifies Allah in his heart and then glorifies the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his heart. And what does that mean? It means placing the word of Allah before our own assumptions, our own thoughts, our own ideologies, our own philosophies, and so on and so forth. And then he says, وَكَمَا لَا يَصْلُحُ لِلَمْسِ جِلْدِ الْمُصْحَفِ كُلُّ يَدْ فَلَا يَصْلُحُ لِتِلَاوَةِ حُرُوفِهِ كُلِّ لِسَانِ أو كُلُّ لِسَانِ He says, just as not every hand is able to touch the mushaf, likewise, not every tongue is able to recite the letters that are contained within the Qur'an, the mushaf. وَلَا لِنَيْلِ مَعَانِيهِ كُلُّ قَلْبِ Likewise, not every heart is befitting or is able to comprehend its meanings. It's only the hearts that have been purified. And this again shows us the importance of purification of the heart, which is something which we overlook today. Something which we don't pay attention to today, especially amongst students of knowledge. Students of knowledge, they pay attention to the Arabic language, to the fiqh, to the usul al-fiqh, to the tajweed, to the tilawa, to the um, makharij, and so on and so forth. But when it comes to purification of the heart, only a few pay attention to it. Why? Because as Imam al-Ghazali, he states in the beginning of his Ihya, it's a bitter pill to swallow that, that a person has sicknesses of the heart that they have to remove. And it's easier to ignore them. And it's not glamorous. It's not glamorous. People are not going to turn to uh, a Tazkiyah class except a very few. Whereas fiqh and khilafat and aqidah and so on and so forth, people enjoy it. So he says, فَتَعْظِيمُ الْكَلَامِ تَعْظِيمُ الْمُتَكَلِّمِ وَلَنْ تَحْضُرَ عَظَمَةَ الْمُتَكَلِّمِ مَا لَمْ يُتَفَكَّرْ فِي صِفَاتِهِ وَجَلَالِهِ وَأَفْعَالِهِ He says, when you glorify the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in doing so, you are glorifying the speaker, i.e. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah azza wa jal. He says, and the greatness of the speaker will not be present in the heart, so long as the owner of that heart does not reflect and contemplate over the attributes of Allah and his actions. And so in order to reflect and to have the ability to comprehend the meanings of the Quran, outside of my recitation of the Quran, I have to be engaged in what? Reflecting and appreciating and glorifying Allah and his attributes and his actions. And this is something that we spoke about previously when we spoke about Khushu' in Salah. Khushu' in Salah starts outside of Salah. 
If I want to have khushu' in my prayer, then I have to develop an attachment to Allah outside of my prayer. I cannot be attached to the dunya for 24 hours and come to salah and expect to have a heart which is present. No, the heart will be present in that which it is attached to. And so if my heart is not present in Allah, then it will, or not attached to Allah, sorry, then it will not be present in the salah with Allah. Likewise, the Quran. If my heart is not attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, how am I supposed to find Allah? How am I supposed to find guidance? And so I have to reflect outside of my ibadah. I have to be present outside of my ibadah, and then I will find the impact of that inside my ibadah. And then he says, which we were just speaking about. He says, the third is to have a present heart. And to leave off subconscious or, or, or even conscious but internal um, conversation. So, for example, I might be reciting the Quran, but I'm talking to myself about something. My mind is wondering. I'm thinking about my bank or my work or my family or my accounting or my whatever it might be. I'm thinking about something else. He says this is problematic and that shouldn't be the case. Why? Because if I'm reading the Quran, then I should be present with the word of Allah. Imagine someone speaking to you or you're speaking to someone else and you can tell this person is not listening. They're agitated, they're looking around, they're you know, concerned with something else. You're going to say this person is a rude person. Or if you're doing that, if you have any, any manners, you'll feel that you're being rude. So likewise, when we're reading the Quran, it's Kalam Allah. And so should I not be present when Allah is speaking to me? Allah is talking to me. This book was sent down to me amongst mankind, to me. I'm a part of mankind. I'm a part of, of the Ummah, inshallah. So therefore, I should be present when Allah is speaking. And this also shows the importance of what? The Arabic language. It shows the importance of the Arabic language. Why? Because it's very difficult to have a present heart if you do not understand what you're reading. And so the person who sincerely wants to be present in the recitation of the Quran should put the time into learning the Arabic language. And for those that have been blessed with the Arabic language, they should understand the great blessing that they have been given and they should take advantage of it. It's such a shame, such a shame that you have Arabic speakers who do not read the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have those born into the Arabic language and they don't take advantage of that. And it's such a shame to find those who have the ability to learn and they don't use that capacity to learn the Arabic language. As we said, the only line of poetry that I've memorized from Al Mutanabih is what did he say? He said, Ma ra'aytu naqsin ka naqsil qadiri ala tamami. And I didn't memorize it from a book. I saw it written on a wall somewhere and it struck me. What he said, I have not seen deficiency like the deficiency of the one who is able to be complete. What does he mean? He means that the person who is intelligent and has the ability to, to succeed, but does not, that person is deficient and his deficiency is a shame. The deficiency of the one who is able to be complete is not like the deficiency of the one who is unable to be complete. When you have a young, talented person, but they don't utilize their talent, you feel, you feel something. It's such a shame this person doesn't work hard. And, and reach his potential. So likewise us, today we have the means and the capacity to learn. As was said, and, and it, it may become boring for some people, but it's <laughs> nearly every week we're saying it. The Arabic language is so easy to learn today. YouTube, there are apps, Duolingo and the other one, I forget, Memorize or something like this, for free. There are apps now where you can find someone who wants to learn your language and you want to learn their language and you start to conversate with each other. You take it in turns. Um, you can pay for a teacher from Egypt, from Mauritania now, from Medina, from Mecca, from many Arabic countries, 20, 30, 40 dollars a month and they'll teach you two or three times a week. What excuse do we have? And then you'll find people that will spend 50 pounds on, on one meal a few hundred pounds on a pair of trainers. But when it comes to learning, they don't have the ability, they don't have the money. They'll, sp they'll spend hours playing computer games or watching films or watching TV shows or playing um, a sport. But when it comes to learning, 
the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, learning the language of, 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 of the Qur'an. Some of the ulama, they say the language of Ahlul Jannah, although there's a difference of opinion about that, but definitely the language of Kalam Allah, the language of Ar Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam, when it comes to that, there's no time, there's no effort, there's no money available, there's no importance attached to it, and that's a big shame. And if you were to tell a person, if you go, if you engage in this course one year, one year course, you're guaranteed to earn between 50 to 60,000 pounds at the end of this one year course, many people will sign up. Many people will sign up. But when it comes to the Arabic language, we can't be found. And the reward for the Arabic language is far greater than 50 to 60,000 pounds per year. Um, so if, if we only take away one thing from this over the last year or two that we've been looking at this book, the next year, two, three, if Allah gives it to us, if we only take away one thing, the significance and the importance of the Arabic language. And we do not want to be from those who do not speak the language of our Ummah. Arabic is the language of Islam. It's not the language of the Arabs. It's the language of Islam. But the, 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 the Arabs, are they've been given a great virtue from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the fact that the Quran and the language of Islam was revealed um, in, in their language. So they, they, have a, they have a virtue, they have a head start. But many Arabs, they take it for granted. And they don't actually benefit, they don't actually develop their Arabic language skills. Um, but the point is, if I want to sit with the word of Allah and open the Quran and reflect and benefit and feel my heart present, the key, key, key component before anything else is the Arabic language. That's the key component. You can read it in the language of your choice, the translation, English, Chinese, you know, whatever it might be. It's not the same. It's not the same. Uh, he says, فَتَعْذِيمُ الْكَلَامِ تَعْذِيمُ الْمُتَكَلِّمُ وَلَنْ تَحْضُرَ عَظَمَةَ الْمُتَكَلِّمِ مَا لَمْ يُتَفَكَّرْ فِي صِفَاتِهِ وَجَلَالِهِ, uh, صفاته وجلاله وأفعاله. Um, then he says, الثالث حضور القلب وترك حديث النفس قيل في تفسير يا يحيى خذ الكتاب بقوة It was said about the verse يحيى take this book with, with strength A بجد واجتهاد Take it with, with, with sternness and with hard work, with effort وأخذه بالجد أن يكون متجردا له عند قراءته أو متجردا متجردا له عند قراءته. He says and the the understanding definition of biljad um, is that when he recites it, when he reads the book that was given to him, that he is stripped of anything else when he is reciting it. Stripped of anything else, i.e., his heart and mind are fully focused on that which he's reading. منصرف الهمة عن غيره that he turns his attention and his ambitions away from anything else. وَكَانَ بَعْضُ السَّلَفِ إِذَا قَرَأَ آيَةً لَمْ يَكُنْ قَلْبُهُ فِيهَا أَعَادَهَا ثَانِيَةً وَهَذِهِ صِفَةٌ تَتَوَلَدُ عَمَّا قَبْلَهَا مِنَ التَّعْظِيمِ He says, and some of the earlier generations of Islam, if they were to read a verse of the Qur'an, but they did not find their heart present in its recitation, what would they do? Read it again, or again, twice or thrice, until they found their heart present. Is this something that we should engage in? Not yet. Not yet. Why? Because this, we're talking about, when we say the Salaf, who were the Salaf? Who, who were they? Th these are, he's giving us an example of the, the, the cream of the crop. And a person who is trying to develop a relationship with the Quran should not start by aspiring towards, they should aspire towards, but they should not start at the place where those who they aspire to were, were at in at their peak. I should look at how they started and start how they started. And so if I read the Quran and I read for 20 minutes a day and my heart is present for 5% of that, Alhamdulillah, that's a start. I learn how to bring my heart into the recitation. I increase it 10%, 20%, 50% until I can get to 99 to 100% and my heart is present. But if I try to have a present heart from the beginning, for the entire 20 to 30 minutes, what's going to happen? It's going to become too, dif too difficult. It's going to become too strenuous. It's going to become very draining mentally and spiritually, and I'm going to give up. And so we, when we read about the Salaf, when we read about the Ulama, the Awliya, we should not compare ourselves to them and put ourselves down. Rather, we should take them as role models and aspire to reach that which they reached. 
Otherwise, we will be stuck where we, where we are and we won't go forward. Because you do not give an example of someone along their way, you give an example of someone at their peak. And so we have to contextualize and understand they got to that place through um, perseverance and, and, and development and so on and so forth. So just again, because there is an issue today, religious OCDs, and we don't want to fall into that. So if I recite the Qur'an, I do not need to repeat the verse over and over again until I find my heart present. No, that's in years to come, inshallah. In the beginning, it's enough just to recite the Qur'an every day. And let the Qur'an do its work. Because the Qur'an itself will have an impact on my heart. Then he says, التدبر, وراء, القلب, القرآن, التدبر التدبر so, he says the fourth point, and this is going to be the, the last, the fifth we're going to leave to, to next week because it's quite a long one, inshallah. So the fourth point, which is at tadabbur And what is tadabbur We've spoken about it a few times, to reflect over the verse, to, to try to derive benefit from the verse, uh, which we'll come to, inshallah. And he says this takes place when the heart is present. It's a stage after the presence of the heart. Why? I cannot reflect on the Quran if my heart isn't present. How? It's not possible. He says, um, because a person may be reading the Qur'an, but they're not really thinking about it. Their mind is not with the Qur'an. They're just simply listening to their own recitation of the Qur'an. And you'll find this sometimes. If you have a daily word of the Qur'an, a daily portion, you start in the beginning and you come close to the end and you don't remember reading in between. Why? Because your mind is somewhere else. And so he's saying, have a present mind so that you can reflect. What does he say? He says, And the whole purpose of reciting is to reflect. That's the purpose. And we said last week, I believe, how do I reflect over the Quran? I ask myself, where am I from this ayah? Where is the ummah from this ayah? Do I find these attributes and qualities mentioned in myself? If they're good, alhamdulillah. If they're bad, then I seek um, change in myself. And I reflect over my own state, etc. Um, that's the beginning anyway. He says, and of course, the more a person learns, the more a person studies, the deeper a person goes into the Arabic language, the more a person knows of fiqh, of usul, and so on and so forth, the deeper a person's reflections can become. And tadabbur is not um, tafsir. So I can reflect, but I cannot give an interpretation. Nor should I start spreading my own reflections. I shouldn't open a YouTube channel or open an Instagram page or open a Facebook page and start to put up my daily reflection of the Quran. No, if you do, if you do that, you're sinning. Why? Because you're not qualified to do so. You're not an alim. And the only person who is allowed to reflect in such a manner publicly is the alim who has reached a very high level of knowledge, not a beginner student of knowledge, someone who who started to learn the Arabic language and so on and so forth. Even if you've memorized the Quran bil qiraat al ashar does not qualify you to give tafsir. Even if you studied an entire madhab, it does not qualify you to give you to give tafsir. Tafsir is the last stage um, that a student of knowledge and alim reaches, the ability to interpret the Quran. That's the, the final stages. Um, and that's why you don't find many ulama that give their own tafsir. You'll find that the tafsir are based upon previous tafsir. They bring from this one, they bring from that one. Maybe they summarize, they abridge, um, they rewrite, etc. But very few ulama have their own tafsir. Why? Because you need to be a mujtahid. And you need to have mastered the foundational, the primary and the secondary subjects of Islam before you can even come close to it. Um, and there's more that can be said, of course. He says, وَلِذَلِكَ سَنَّ فِيهِ التَّرْتِيلِ reciting the Qur'an in the manner of tartil, where a person is reciting the Qur'an at a medium to slow pace, it's sunnah. Why? Because it leads to a tadabbur So this is an external sunnah that leads to an internal action, which is a tadabbur um, Whereas if you're rushing, it limits the ability to reflect. And then he says, قَالَ عَلِي رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَنْ لَا خَيْرَ فِي عِبَادَةٍ لَا فِقْهَ فِيهَا وَلَا خَيْرَ فِي قِرَاءَةٍ لَا تَدَبُّرَ فِيهَا 
he says that Ali an, he said there is no goodness in worship that does not have within it fiqh, comprehension. And there is no goodness in recitation that does not have within it reflection. Again, contextualize. When was this said? 1,400 years ago, perhaps. We have to contextualize. If I'm just reading the Quran daily, in this day and age, alhamdulillah, that's a, a big plus. And I can get to that stage of tadabbur slowly but surely. But I should not put myself off by saying I'm not perfect, therefore I'm not going to allow myself to be good. No, I don't have to be perfect, being good is enough. If I read the Quran every day, that's good. I want to get to that level of perfection where I'm reflecting on the Quran, so I, I try to, um, to take that journey. Then he says, وَإِذَا لَمْ يَتَمَكَّنْ مِنَ التَّدَبُّرْ إِلَّا بِتَرْدِيدْ فَلْيُرَدِّدْ إِلَّا أَنْ يَكُونَ خَلْفَ إِمَامٍ uh, Al-Ghazali, Allah Ta'ala, he says, if a person is unable to reflect except with repetition of the verse, then let him repeat, unless he's praying behind an imam. As that's not the purpose of the recitation um, in, in that moment necessarily, when behind an imam. Um, then he says, وَعَنْ أَبِي ذَرْ رَجَلَ تَعَانْ قَالْ قَامَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ بِنَا لَيْلَةً فَقَامَ بِآيَةً يُرَدِّدُهَا وَهِيَا إِن تُعَذِّبْهُمْ إِن تُعَذِّبْهُمْ فَإِنَّهُمْ عِبَادُكْ So Abu Dhar رَجَلَ تَعَانْ He prayed behind the Prophet عليه وسلم السلام نفل صلاة uh, قيام الليل and there was an ayah that he was he was repeating over and over again. The Prophet ﷺ, into uh, If you punish them, then they are your servants. Uh, and if you forgive them, then you are al aziz al hakim. And so the Prophet ﷺ was repeating this ayah, and Imam Al Ghazali is showing us that this was a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, particularly in the night prayer. And there are many narrations and stories about um, ulama and awliya repeating one single verse over and over again. And the ulama, they, they mention if you find your heart in a verse, you find your heart in a verse, meaning it strikes you, then it's recommended that you repeat it um, and, and you allow the, 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 uh, the impact to, to, um, to be amplified in the heart. And there are certain things that the ulama, they also mention that aid the heart in reflection, which I'm sure we're going to come to later on, inshallah, maybe in a few months, maybe in a year, Allah knows best when we get there. But as we're on the point of reflection, there are a few things, the ulama of the past, the awliya, the salaf, they mention that soften the heart and their opposites harden the heart. What are those things? Less sleep softens the heart, but not less sleep to the extent where I'm exhausted and tired. To not like sleeping one hour a night, for example. No, but sleeping too much hardens the heart. Eating too much hardens the heart. Talking too much hardens the heart. And the opposite soften the heart. Talking less, eating less, and sleeping less. And some of the, the, the ulama of the past, contemporary as well, they would suffice with five hours of sleep. Some would even less. But Less than five hours is, is very difficult, except for a few, perhaps. Especially when you have a um, an exhausting kind of day, as in traveling and working and so on and so forth. Um, eating less softens the heart. And try it for yourself. If you reflect at the end of a day where you have been fasting prior to um, your iftar, you will find that your heart is softer. Uh, making dua when you are... When you haven't been eating, your heart is softer. You will find the tears are closer to your eyes than when you have been eating throughout the day and overeating perhaps. Um, likewise, not speaking too much. These things, they harden the heart. Joking. Joking hardens the heart. And this is one of the calamities of our day. Too much joking. But it shouldn't be that we don't joke at all. No, but joking is like salt to a meal. If you add too much salt, then it ruins the meal. If you don't add any salt, then you don't kind of uh, amplify the flavors. So this joking is it's it's a positive. The Prophet Ali used to joke, but too much joking joking hardens the heart. Um, and so there are points to if if we if to discuss when it comes to reflecting. And Abi Al Ghazali is going to mention some of them um, in this chapter and in the future when it comes to especially when it comes to food and our relationship with food. 
And unfortunately, in modern society today, we have a very unhealthy relationship with food. Those of us that eat too much, those of us that eat too little, those of us that eat, you know, um, moderately, our relationship is still not what it should be due to the ingredients and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, we shouldn't let perfection be the enemy of good. We should try our best to, to, to be good. And when we speak about these types of things, the way we eat, the way we sleep, the way we talk, joking, etc., we have to realize these are not standards, these are ideals. And so I should not, for example, if I have a day where I'm talking a lot, but I'm not talking about haram things, I shouldn't then beat myself up and say, oh, you, you've had a bad day. No, it's not, it's not haram to talk. There are things that it's haram to talk about. There are things that are haram to say, but it's not haram per se to talk. These are ideals. They're ideals. So I should get to a place where I say to myself, I don't want to talk too much. But for example, a man goes home to his wife and his wife wants to talk. And he says, I'm not going to talk a lot. Internally, he says, I'm not going to talk a lot. He's going to give himself a problem. <laughs> Likewise, the wife you know, the wife, although some husbands might, may say, they might say, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> so, depends on the relationship. But um, likewise with children, you know. <laughs> Sorry, sisters. Likewise with children. So, with children, for example, um, it, I can't be serious with my child all day, sit and talk about politics and philosophy and theology. and No, I have to joke. I have to play. Schoolwork. Yeah, schoolwork. I have to, I have to play. Um, and the Prophet ﷺ, this was when you look at the character of the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ, he, he would take on the, 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 the nature of those whom he was speaking to. When he was speaking to children, he would speak to them in, in, in accordance to their mannerisms and their demeanor. When he was speaking to the people of the bad, yeah, the Bedouins, he would speak to them accordingly. When he was speaking to his close companions, he would speak to them accordingly. When he was speaking to leaders, he would speak to them accordingly. And so this is an important quality to try to, to learn. Um, as they say, read the room. Um, likewise with sleep. For example, I might sleep for eight or nine hours daily. If I were to cut down to five hours, it may harm me. Um, so I say to myself, okay, I want to slowly cut down. But if I'm cutting down the hours of my sleep and then I'm using that time for silly things, what's the point? I might as well sleep. It's better to sleep than to use that time in, 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 in useless behavior um, or in haram, for example. And so every person has to know themselves. Um, it's the same with zuhud. What's zuhud? To leave off the comforts of this dunya, etc. For some people, the comforts of this dunya help them to worship. For others, they don't. And so it's about learning yourself, you know, and especially when it comes to suluk. Suluk is about learning about yourself, learning about yourself, what works, what doesn't, but not justifying um, for yourself the dunya, the comforts of the dunya, and so on and so forth. But if I, if I need six hours of sleep, seven hours of sleep, and I cut down to four and I'm unable to worship, then it's, it, it, it beats the point. If I have to eat three times a day, small light meals, and I can't worship without them, then it beats the point. But if I'm able to, um, to have some tahammul, then I should learn it, especially for the men, especially young men, uh, for young men. And, and we did speak about this before, the whole drinking two liters of water a day and, and things like this, is that actually positive behavior, <laughs> carrying around water bottles, um, you know, you're going on a, on a journey from one side of London to the other side of London and you're expected to carry a water bottle in case you become dehydrated on a, on a, on a trip that lasts you for one hour. Whereas previously, people travel for days and they may have a very small amount of water to hamwood, you know, the ability to forbear difficulties. So I'm sure we should be able to forbear the difficulty of being dehydrated for a one hour journey on the central line, for example. Um, so, so these things are important for us to reflect over, especially for young men. Um, but it's besides the point, we conclude with that, inshallah.